want to speak with you today about a distinction that I think can be made within human experience or about human experience. And I titled the talk, The Power of Extraordinary Experience. It'll take me a few minutes to get there. Um, the distinction is here. Uh, I've noticed that there's ordinary experience, there's extraordinary experience, and there's extraordinary experience. And let me use these three to make some distinctions about who we are and how we experience. So let's first talk about ordinary experience. What is ordinary experience? Well, it's almost everything we've ever experienced. It's everything we talk about, virtually everything we talk about during our lives, during our day. It's everything you hear on the news. It's everything you read in the paper. And yeah, there are probably small little exceptions but ordinary experience is the most common thing there is. It's been going on for a really long time in humanity. Um, there was a time, uh, I think, several thousand years ago when Greek thought is, was dominant on the planet and it is what we know of that time. And the Greeks conceived of human experience as the wheel of life, the circle. So things would come around and around, people die, new people are born, they fit themselves into the roles that were already prescribed and the same dramas play themselves over and over again. So here's my little prop. Um, here's my little prop, it's a slinky. And uh, when it's compressed like this, it kind of represents the circle of life, you know, not the circle of life in the Disney sense, but the one in terms of, well, it's a, it's a new generation, but it's the same old thing. And then um, there was a time, I guess about 3,500 years ago, 3,000 years ago, when something changed, something really important changed. And what changed was the story that people tell about life about their lives and about life. And I'm not real clear about the details of the story. There came to be a, a story about Abraham hearing the voice and something came into human experience that hadn't been there before. Abraham heard the voice with a capital V and later on Moses heard the voice. There was a covenant that was established and it, my sense of that covenant was God saying, if you guys behave like this, I'll make things better for you. I'll give you this land or I'll do this or that or the other thing, whatever it was. And what got introduced into the human story at that moment was possibility. Possibility of getting out of the circle. Uh, and so things started to go like that. In other words, there started to be possibility of new coming into the human experience. So it wasn't just a repetition over and over again. Uh, newness could show up, something that wasn't there before. Uh, the folks who developed that story, we now today call them Hebrews or Jews. And I highly recommend a book uh, called The Gifts of the Jews by Thomas Cahill where he explains that in rich detail, how that came about. But it's still ordinary experience. There was now in the human story, well, things will be better for my kids or their kids. We still have that in our story today, obviously. But uh, it, was, it was different from what had come before, but it was still ordinary experience. So most of recorded history is ordinary experience, almost all of what we hear about, read about, and so on, and it barely raises an eyebrow. You know, we've, we've said, we humans have said many times, well, this time it's different. And yes, there is progress. Human rights came into being, civil rights came into being. But if you stand back and you look, despots come and go, wars come and go, we're still in that cycle for the most part. Shakespeare had a 
had a quote about that, or Shakespeare wrote a soliloquy about that uh, in Macbeth. He said, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps slowly in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. I feel like that soliloquy encapsulates most of human history over and over and over again. And even the stretching of the helix is still ordinary experience. So we might ask, what is ordinary experience? Let's, let's inquire into it a little deeper and see what it is and how it comes into being. So the first question about, about this distinction I'm making is how do we know what we know? Well, for the most part, other people tell us. It starts with our parents and then the teachers and then the people who wrote the books and the articles and the stuff that we read. So most of what we know, we, we know because other people told us. Now there's also another category, which is sometimes we find out for ourselves. We, it's called trial and error. We make mistakes and we go, oh, that doesn't work. And oh, let's try this. Well, that doesn't work either. Well, how about this? Oh, that kind of worked. You know, I got that. So we're learning as we go along, that's finding out for ourselves. And then once in a while, there's knowing from the self. Once in a while, there's intuition, an intuitive understanding of something. You know, uh, uh, we're, told, we're told to think outside the box, but nobody ever tells us what the box is or where it is or what it's made of or where the walls are or where the door is or if there's a door, a way out. Um, and once in a while, somebody gets a flash of inspiration and maybe just sort of falls into the door and it opens and like, oh, there it is. There's a, there's a way out. And then what happens is the box expands to enclose what just happened. And there you are in the box again. And that's kind of a sense of ordinary experience. So how does this all work? Okay. So our nervous systems our senses, the nerves in between the senses and the brain and the brain, they are interpreters of sensory data. So you open your eyes in the morning or whenever, and there are all of a sudden more electrical impulses happening in the eyes and in the optic nerve and stuff happens in the brain and there's now a picture. So I have this movie, I have this picture of this room and all, and y'all in it. And um, so, so I'm taking, for example, vision. Here's a little thing about there's, there's a light source and there's an object and the light ray hits the object and goes into my eye. And our brains make pictures out of electrical impulses. And we assume that those pictures, I assume that this picture that I have that I'm actually looking at now represents something that's actually out there. Well, by what, by what right am I assuming that there's actually number one and out there and that the picture that I see represents what's out there? How do I know that the picture in my brain represents what's actually there? How could I tell? See, I can't get out of this picture to see what's out there, if there's an out there. I I'm looking at a picture. I'm looking at an interpretation that my brain is making of the, the, it, the sensory data, the, the, the vibrations that are happening on my optic nerve. And obviously you can extrapolate that to all your other senses. So I'm making an interpretation of those impulses the same way that TV, if it were the same way that TV is converting electrical impulses into a picture. 
my brain's doing the same thing. It's a biological mechanism as opposed to a, to a whatever that is, but it's doing the same thing. It's creating a, a, a picture out of electrical impulses. And the, here's the completely non-intuitive truth that I'm starting with here. We're living inside our own interpretations. We think we're living in the world, but the world's an interpretation. The world is an interpretation that we're making. What you call, what I call the world is made entirely of interpretations. It's not made of protons and electrons and neutrons and quarks. That's a model. That's not reality. Reality for me right now is an interpretation that I'm making of all the electrical impulses that are coming down the pipe. Really? <laughs> well, here's a quote from Amit Goswami, whom I've, uh, he's a quantum physicist who I'm, whom I've quoted in here before. He says, there is no object in space time without a conscious subject looking at it. And my study of quantum physics, which took place a long time ago, admittedly, uh, led me to the same conclusion. Read that again. Yeah, go back to that. There is no object in space-time without a conscious subject looking at it. So look at an object in this room or in your field of view. There is no such object without you looking at it. And I'd like you to take just a moment and look at what that says about you just for a moment what does it say to you that there is no object in space-time without a conscious subject looking at it so you're the conscious subject you're looking at an object but there is no such object without you looking at it it's worth pondering See, what we call reality is a continuous flow of interpretation. And I call that continuous flow the water we swim in. We've never been outside that water. There are people whom we've perhaps met, certainly people who we've heard tell about or read about who have momentarily been outside that water. My metaphor for that is that you're swimming around, you're a fish, you're swimming around, and all of a sudden there's something sharp and tugging on your cheek, and you get pulled out of the water. Fortunately, you're in a catch and release area and you get put back, but now you've been out of the water. Now you can actually distinguish water from everything else, whereas before you couldn't do that because it was everything you knew. Ordinary experience amounts to swimming in the water that represents what we all know. Let me say that again. Ordinary experience is swimming in the water that represents all we know. All we know. That's ordinary experience. Just swimming in the water. Yeah, new things appear in the water. Rocks, other fish, bigger fish. But it's still ordinary. Okay, let's go back to my three types of experience. So we've, I've talked at length about ordinary experience. There's also extraordinary experience and extraordinary experience. So let's go down the list. What's extraordinary experience? Well, they're sometimes called peak experiences. Now, again, this is my uh, effort to make some distinctions. Other people might have a different definition of extraordinary experience but I'm having it refer to what is sometimes called peak experiences. They're, they tend to be punctuated by people saying something like, oh, wow, you know, <laughs> an incredible sunset or, a, or, an, or, a, or an experience with another person or whatever it is for you. Uh, you probably all know who Abraham Maslow is. He's the creator of the hierarchy of needs. He wrote a book called Religions, Values, and Peak Experience, and he said, putting on my glasses, he said, extraordinary experiences are exciting, oceanic, deeply moving, exhilarating, elevating experiences that generate an advanced form of perceiving reality. 
and are even mystic and magical in their effect upon the experimenter. Conjure up for yourselves a peak experience that you had once. Maybe it was just on your own and maybe you consumed something. In, e in either case, doesn't matter for this purpose, remember a peak experience that you had, a, a, an experience that just blew you out of the water and that maybe you were able to articulate it, maybe you weren't, and maybe you expressed it in art or music or dance or whirling dervishing or something. You express, you express that extraordinary experience. All of us have had those, some more than others. And they kind of represent a, an abrupt expansion, kind of an abrupt expansion of possibility. And we remember them. We tend to remember them. We file them away in our memory system and they become part of ourselves. And once again, the box expands to enclose the peak experience and you're in the box. So we make extraordinary experiences ordinary. And if you're like me, you feel a little sadness when that happens. Or when you look back at that peak experience and remember that it was, but you're not there now, and so it's ordinary again. So the way we know we're having a peak or extraordinary experience, well, other people tell us that. Wow, you had a real peak experience when you did that. We found out for ourselves trial and error and something spoke to us from within that said, this is special, remember this. We become in that moment heightened interpreters of sensory data. We're still interpreting sensory data, but it's heightened in some way. And here's Maslow again, the emotional reaction in the peak experience has a special flavor of wonder, of awe, of reverence, of humility and surrender before the experience as before something great. But we're still living inside our own interpretations and we're still mistaking our, our interpretations for the world itself. We're making an interpretation it's a heightened interpretation, but we're still immersed in those interpretations. Okay, so what's extraordinary experience? And my spelling is deliberate. My putting in the hyphen to separate extraordinary is deliberate. My first contact with extraordinary experience was in reading about it. And it was in Castaneda who was kind of required reading in the early 70s for any of us who were questioning what is going on. Here's a quote from his third book. Stopping the world is indeed an appropriate rendition of certain states of awareness in which the reality of everyday life is altered because the flow of interpretation, which ordinarily runs uninterruptedly, uninterruptedly has been stopped by a set of circumstances alien to that flow. Stopping the world is stopping the flow of interpretation. This is not heightening the interpretation. This is not stretching the box. This is like no box. Doesn't last long typically, but it, alt it has the capacity to alter your life forever when it happens. I want to make it clear that extraordinary experience is not required. It's not a requisite for this path that we're all on. It isn't required for a happy, joyful existence. Examples of extraordinary experience include the channeling of voices, such as Abraham and Sanaya and Seth. They also include near-death experiences, such as those related by Dr. Eben Alexander and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, to name just a couple. People do have extraordinary experiences. We've heard about them, we've read about them. And here's a quote from a fellow, Joseph Selby, I believe, who wrote a book called The Physics of God. 
And he said, it is the testimony of these men and women that should interest us most because it is they who have had the actual transcendent experiences from which all spirituality springs and by which it is perpetually refreshed. So here I'd like to do a reading from our new book, uh, The Water We Swim In. One day in 1974, I bought an international scout in Southern California and began to drive it back home to Colorado. I had several criteria for what car to buy. It had to have room for a bunch of music equipment and it had to have four wheel drive. It was okay with me that it wasn't very attractive and it wasn't the color I thought I wanted. What I didn't consider at all was fuel economy. Back then I was based in Aspen, making a living as a musician. Now when I say making a living, I mean paying rent and buying food and occasionally having some extra spending money. I didn't have a credit card and I didn't have a cell phone. And on that particular day, I had what I thought was enough cash to make the trip home. As I drove to the San Francisco Bay Area to visit some friends, I started thinking about the rather poor gas mileage, the price of gas, the miles to go, and how much money I had in my wallet. I knew it would be a closer call than I had anticipated, but I had to get home. As I prepared to depart Berkeley for Aspen, I stopped at a filling station to top off the tank. Those were the days when you could look in the pipe and see the surface of the liquid, and I could see it shimmering in the sunlight. Setting off on my journey with a light heart, I gradually felt that lightness disappear. I was having a conversation with myself, worrying about how much gas this car used and about whether I would actually have enough money to get home. And this frightened me. I'd never experienced being alone on the road and having to hitchhike or whatever else might be required. I felt the fear in my stomach and in my chest, and as I drove, it became more and more oppressive. Now, religion of any kind was not part of my childhood experience, and I had never before thought of praying to whomever or whatever might be listening. But on that morning, I did just that, essentially confessing my sins, such as the arrogance of my refusal to quit the music business and get a real job, my insistence that I was right and my mother was wrong regarding my attitude about money and about the way I was living my life in general. In the next moment, I clearly heard a strong, powerful voice that spoke with complete authority. It said, don't worry, Larry, we'll get you home. Immediately, there was no conversation in my head. I knew that something very profound had happened, and in some sense, the way I viewed the world had fundamentally shifted. Though at the time, I had no words to express that shift. My heart was beating a little faster, and I felt a lightness in something I might have called breathless anticipation. Realizing that I was now fully present in that car in that central valley of California, noticing the scenery, hearing the car's noises, and aware of my breathing, I felt a calmness come over me that I had rarely experienced. The usual mental chatter, which I sometimes call the internal dialogue, it, was conspicuous by its absence. I experienced that silence with feelings of great relief. Somehow, I knew I was okay and that this situation would work itself out one way or another. As you might expect, the silence didn't last and I was soon indulging in my usual mental chatter. At some point, I happened to glance at my gas gauge. I saw that it had not moved from its full reading and by my calculations, the car by now should have used about a quarter of a tank. My first reaction was something like, oh great, now the gas gauge isn't working. I'll have to get that fixed. Although, since I know how many miles per gallon I'm getting, I can still figure out when I need gas. Shortly thereafter, the gas gauge began to fall. Now my thinking was, well, okay, it doesn't register the first quarter tank drop, so I can compensate for whatever it reads, no problem. As I approached the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, I decided to stop and top off the tank again. The gauge was now reading three quarters full. I pumped the gas and as I stood there, I was still feeling some of the relief I had felt when the mental chatter had stopped. 
The pump clicked off, and as I hung up the hose, I looked at the reading. The car had taken a quarter of a tank of gas, not the half tank I would have expected. I looked in the gas pipe, and there was the surface of the liquid shimmering as before. A strange mixture of disbelief and complete trust washed over me. On the one hand, I had no way to explain what had just happened, and on the other, I was still feeling that everything was fine. In terms of what I see now, the world had stopped for me. By that, I mean the normal flow of events, and most importantly, the flow of interpretation of those events stopped for me because my rational mind had no answer, no explanation. I had the clear thought that I had just experienced something outside the boundaries I had always assumed were dictated by reality, by the laws of physics, and so on. I call that interruption of the flow of interpretation extraordinary experience, and it's distinct from extraordinary experience, otherwise known as peak experience, where one's senses are heightened and one's emotions can be overwhelming. Looking back at that day over the last 40 plus years, I have no other choice but to see that event as having heard the quiet voice of all of creation, that which I have come to call spirit or all that is. It's interesting to me that the voice spoke in the plural. That represents to me the idea, which has been expressed throughout the ages, that we're all one, all expressions of the same unity of consciousness. It said seven words to me. Don't worry, Larry, we'll get you home. And those seven words have sustained me in here for the last 46 years and for the duration, I'm sure. That was an extraordinary experience. An extraordinary experience cannot be explained in terms of the way you understand the world. And um, one of the things I teach you in physics is that the perpetual motion machine is impossible. Something that keeps running and doesn't consume the available source of fuel. Well, that's what happened. I have no other way to explain that. That was my extraordinary experience. Now, what do you do with somebody who has an extraordinary experience? Well, typically what we do is we put them on a pedestal and we venerate them in some way and we think of ourselves as different from them. I'm not, don't do that to me. I was given an extraordinary experience and it's clear to me that what you're supposed to do with an extraordinary experience is share it. You're, what you're supposed to do is have it transform your life and then you're supposed to find a way to articulate that transformation. Not to put yourself somewhere on a pedestal, not to build up your ego, although that happens and you have to keep sort of intervening in that ordinary uh, automatic process, but to share it in such a way that it inspires other people and lets them know that there are possibilities that they have never glimpsed, whatever that looks like in their own experience. And the way I think of myself now is um, there's this image that came to me of the Indian scout. You know, the only way to know what's over that hill is to go look. But you don't uproot the entire encampment to climb the hill, you just send a scout. Now the scout needs good eyesight he needs a calm demeanor so he doesn't go, oh my God, look what's down there. That would attract attention that the, that the encampment doesn't need. And the scout needs a commitment to serve the tribe. So the scout goes back and informs the elders of what he's seen over the hill. And um, that was probably something that uh, Sitting Bull did and, and Custer didn't was send a scout. So I feel like myself as a scout. I got a peek over that hill and I want to let you know that the possibilities for living, for being as a human being are vastly beyond anything that any of us have ever otherwise glimpsed. And I'm just the scout. And you know, when those experiences happen, they're perfectly and exquisitely tailored to the person having that experience. 
how more exquisite could it be than somebody who spent years studying physics gets to figure out how the car goes without using any gas? How perfect is that? You know, other people have had experiences in times past, 2,000 years ago, more, would never have had an experience that they could articulate in those terms. It wouldn't have been appropriate. But this was perfect for me to really get me, to have me get it and say, oh, okay, never mind. I thought I understood how this works. Clearly, I don't. And in that moment, you're open enough to be filled with possibility, to be filled with something new. So you don't venerate the scout or put them on a pedestal. You just listen to them. So um, that's the end of what I had prepared for you all today. I just I want to once again express from the bottom of my heart, the opportunity that it is, the opportunity that it is to do this, and to be with you all, uh, it would be a very different experience without you here. Um, and I realize I'm, I'm making an, you know, when I say you here, like those butts in the chairs, that's an interpretation. <laughs> what's behind that? I I sense that what's that, that what's behind the interpretation, the, the layer of interpretation is not bounded by time and it's not bounded by space and it's where we all are and it's where we all have always been and it's where we all will always be. And that where isn't in this four dimensional world, the three dimensions of time and space. It's in a fifth dimension that you can't point to. <laughs> Thanks everybody. It's it's a real privilege to do this.